Hello, good afternoon. You're watching Media Live from the News Hub with me, Portia Gabo. Coming up, the headlines. Police in Kumasi arrest three persons to assist with investigation in connection with the murder of a two force at Samponhene. Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana complain of no subsidized fertilizer since July this year in the whole of northern Ghana. On the International Front, Opposition Labour Party calls for a recall of UK Parliament to tackle Brexit crisis. In our very first story, four suspected armed robbers on two motorbikes have allegedly shot a mobile money vendor at Vitin, a suburb of Tamale. The 31-year-old victim, Abu Bakari Yusuf, is alleged to have been shot twice in the arm. The incident happened on Sunday, August 18, at about 7 p.m. According to a police report signed by its Northern Region Public Relations Officer, DSP Yusuf Tanko, the robbers are alleged to have bolted with a cash amount of 2,000 CDs, some scratch cards, and two mobile phones belonging to the victim. The report further indicates five spent shells fired from AK-47 rifles suspected to have been used for the robbery were also retrieved from the scene. The victim was rushed to the Tamale Teaching Hospital where he's currently receiving treatment. The statement says investigation is ongoing and the public is entreated to come forth with relevant information with the potential of aiding in the arrest of the suspects. Meanwhile, residents say the development is a reflection of the growing insecurity in the metropolis. This is the third time in two years where mobile money vendors were attacked in the metropolis. You're watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Let's now continue with the rest of our stories and a collaborative effort of both the Savannah and Northeast Regional Police Command has led to the arrest of two persons suspected to have murdered the two persons who died in Lukula last Saturday. The two, Abdul Rauf and Ami Dufuseni, were arrested in the early hours of Sunday, August 18, 2019, at Sandema in the Upper East Region, where they fled and went hiding. A statement signed by the Northern Region Public Relations Officer of the Ghana Police Service, DSP Yusuf, said the suspects are expected to be brought to Damango today, Monday, to help in investigations. The statement further indicated Lukula and its environment are quiet following this deployment of police and military personnel to the community and its surrounding areas. It will be recalled that on Friday, August 16, conflict broke out in Lukula over the building of a mox. The situation led to the death of Ali Duyakuba, 37, and Amadou Yakubu. Four others sustained various degrees of gunshot wounds and were rushed to health facilities around Lukula. Let's now focus on agriculture and Ghana has invested $16 million in the last 10 years into agriculture and agriculture related activities based on the African Green Revolution Forum AgriF agenda championed by the late Kofi Annan and first established in 2010. The AgriF has emerged as Africa's leading platform of agriculture that brings together a range of critical stakeholders in the African agriculture landscape. considered the world's most important and impactful forum for African agriculture, pulling together stakeholders in the agricultural landscape to take practical actions and share lessons that will move African agriculture forward. AGRF was first established in 2010, following a three-year series of African Green Revolution conferences, AGRC, held in Oslo, Norway from 2006 to 2008. At a media briefing by the Information Ministry in Accra, West African Resident Director of the African Green Revolution Forum, Foster Boateng, outlined some of the investments Ghana has made. In the past decade, Ghana has we have made about almost 60 million US dollars in investment. The investment has been in the area of research, supporting PhD research in crop breeding. We have also supported seed production. We have also supported private sector investments into 
agro processing. The AGRF has emerged as Africa's leading platform of agriculture platforms that brings together a range of critical stakeholders in the African agriculture landscape to discuss and commit to programs, investment, and policies that can counter the major challenges affecting the agricultural sector on the continent. Since the first AGRF was held in Ghana in 2010, the forum has annually brought together heads of state, ministers, business leaders, developers, Development partner leaderships, researchers, thought leaders, farmer organization representatives, youth entrepreneurs, and other critical stakeholders to focus on the actions and policies needed to move the continental agenda forward. AGRF is an alliance of partners that care about, commit to, and drive inclusive agricultural transformation in Africa along the agricultural value chain. This year we are launching AGRF in Ghana. The D1 will involve people in agro-processing, people who are also farmers, people who also provide uh, mechanization services to farmers for them to talk about. After the AGR, we also follow up with some of the deals to make sure that we, we really lock in the deals. We still have more updates on agriculture, especially with regards to subsidized fertilizers. But before that, embattled CEO of Men's Gold, Nanapia Mensa Namwan, has been addressing the media for the first time since he was granted bail after returning from Dubai. And my colleague Komla Kluche is there and joins us for updates. Thanks for your time, Komla. Uh, their investments back. Now, the question is that when are you expecting to be able to retrieve this finances from Dubai? and to be able to pay your customers. The, the court in Dubai established timelines for you to be able to retrieve these monies or it is open to you know, negotiations with this company. You do mention that you expect that government should be able to support you with international lawyers to go after this. So the question is, when are you able to get this money in your accounts to be able to save Thank you. your customers? Thank you. Next person, please. <laughs> My name is Arnold Mensa Lavagno, Xylophone FM and 5 in 5. I've got two in one questions. The first one, is Men's Gold a Ponzi scheme? The second one, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, gave you a directive to shut down the gold vault and pay your customers. Why did you shut down the gold vault and not pay the customers? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Mensa. Yes, sir. Um, your name, you know. My name is Nanapoku from Daily Searchlight. Nanapoku. I think the bureau about what is happening now is about licensing. Now, you have made it emphatically clear that you have acquired all the legal documents pertaining to your business. Can you show a copy or copies to the press or to the Ghanaian populace or to the world that indeed you have all the legal documents that you are working with? And my second question, please, 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 I beg your pardon. The man in Dubai, the, uh, I don't know the name, it's a long name, who um, um, allowed the uh, security agencies to incarcerate you. Now that you have come out, that the claim was making against you uh, were false, what are you going to do? Are you going to take legal action against him or are you just letting, you're going to leave you off the hook? Thank you. Please, let's ask only one question, please. It's very important. Okay, over to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, um, Mr. Favor Nuno of BBC. To know um, when we are collecting, you know, the money that is owed to us in um, Dubai, the UAE. Just as I indicated in my statement, um, right after I won the case, uh, uh, the judges in the Dubai Superior Court ruled a case in in my favor. You know, the next thing would have been to like. Um, do the necess do the you know necessary 
um, arrangements and or push the necessary, file the necessary applications and whatnot, you know, just so I can recover the money and then um, still come back to the propositions that one of the propositions that we have, you know, tabled for government, write to government and then uh, plead with them to like find a way to unfreeze our account just so it can be transferred because the invoice, we finish, the invoice we finish them, the account on it, you know, is, is um, yeah, it's men's good, and men's good account has been. So, but, um, but for the Interpol red notice, you know, I, as soon as I left, you know, the, the criminal, as soon as the criminal proceeding, the first criminal proceeding was done, the Interpol red notice kicked in, you know, so I was still um, under detention, you know, so I couldn't do any of this. So now that I'm, I'm home, it's important that I show my customers and shareholders, uh, what's it called, patrons, and then the whole Ghanaians, the general public, respect, you know, by briefing them as to what exactly transpired, you know, from my perspective. And then thereafter, we will sit with the lawyers and then engage um, the Attorney General's office, you know, so we can um, pursue, you know, that amount. So we're hoping that that would be done as soon as possible. However, um, that is not the only asset our company has. So that is not a do or die or make or break, you know. But um, so we would hold on to other assets that we have, you know, just so we'll be able to adequately meet our liabilities to our customers. So this is my position on that. So, and then you also asked as to whether the court gave timelines. No, um, there were no timelines attached. Then Mr. Arnold Mesa of Vibe in Five, right? A xylophone um, FM. You want to know as to whether Men's Gold is a Ponzi scheme? <laughs> Men's Gold is not a Ponzi scheme. Um, let me seize this opportunity to shed light more like, you know, on the operations. I'm sure this is in reference to the gold collectible trade and not our gold export and then our uh, assaying and smelting and assaying. Now, the gold collectible trade was... Nana Pia Mensa responding to some questions from the media. We'll bring you updates in our subsequent bulletins. But Komla Kluche is at the press briefing and joins us. Komla, what has Nam one been saying about how the company intends to pay clients? Well, I mean, it is, it is, it is quite clear on uh, three propositions that he's made to do. The government one, he says that for him to be able to pay the people or his uh, customers, one government needs to help him and freeze his assets and uh, his bank accounts. You know, uh, it, he makes the point that even if any other money that is owed him now, the money cannot go through the system because one, his assets, including a bank account, have been frozen. He also makes the point that. Uh, some other businesses, I mean, he mentions Jack Maas, Alibaba, Facebook, and other things. I think that he says that these people have used their own mindset to make better lives for the people. And it's a thing that he's also employing. And he believes that if the state institution says that there's everything wrong with their dom documentations legally, he is calling on them to rather come up and help him to get the appropriate documentations if they feel that these things are wrong. And then also he makes the point that, well, he is willing to pay the people as and when all these conditions are met. And the question again to him was whether or not uh, the government does meet the three propositions that he's making. If the government doesn't meet it, then what happens to the customers? Well, he says that he is quite hopeful that the government would, would, or the state, as a matter of fact, will uh, uh, buy into the propositions that he is given. He equally did speak about the fact that he did not jump bail, contrary to what had been in the media in the past, that he jumped bail, the more reason the red alert was issued on him. In fact, he said that he left the shores of Ghana, went to, to Europe, and finally ended up in Dubai. Before he left for the, for the last time, he checked in at Iyoko, signed the necessary documentation. So the talk about him jumping bill 
and all of that. I mean, it's, it's news to him because as far as he is concerned, he was at Yuku and left the shores of the country legally. So he did not do that. Uh, he's also unable to talk about how much he owes the, the, the customers and then the number of them he owes. You know, the state did indicate in the suit, the state says that he owes about 1.6 billion. And the question I posed to him was whether uh, he should confirm to us whether or not that is what he owes. He's unable to tell because he says he doesn't even have access to most of the documentations and things that he needs to, to be able to do the cross-checking and all that. That's quite a curious one, though. But these are the words or the things that he's saying. But he's very, very hopeful that if processes go through in his favor, his customers will receive their money immediately, putting his own integrity on the line. Pamela, were some clients at the press briefing? Uh, no, 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 not at all. I mean, if you look at where they're doing the press conference, at the MG Grand Hotel here in East Lagoon, even before you enter, heavily armed to the chief uh, police squad, that's the SWAT team, are here. They even had to take the journalists out of the press conference room, sweep the whole room, do a thorough search before you enter. Right. So no customers at all have made any appearance here. Right. And uh, the police have said that they would take absolutely no demonstration whatsoever from any of the customers if they do make an appearance here. Thank you very much for your time. And Komla Kluche is at the press briefing where Namwan is addressing the media for the very first time. He's still watching Media Live from the News Hub. Let's go back to agriculture where the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana is complaining of no subsidized fertilizer since July this year up to date in the whole of northern Ghana. The association says there have also been an increase in fertilizer smuggling in the country. A few weeks ago, President Ekufado promised to to prosecute persons, particularly personnel of security agencies who would be caught in aiding in the smuggling of fertilizers meant for farmers under the Planting for Food and Jobs program. And following the launch of the farming season and distribution of fertilizers under the Planting for Food and Jobs, farmers are expected to enjoy a subsidy on fertilizer. Though some new modalities were introduced this year to curb the smuggling of the Planting for Food and Jobs fertilizer, there have been reports of smuggling of the product to neighboring countries with several thousand bags, bags impounded at various borders in the country. In the studio with me is Charles Naba. He is Program Officer for the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Charles, thanks for your time. So how serious is the issue of fertilizer smuggling? Um, thank you so much and uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's been long. I think uh, the 2019 smuggling is so serious to the extent that the peak of the season where fertilizer is needed. We have been pursuing this fertilizer since 15th of July. And until date, there is no single subsidized fertilizer in all the production areas that uh, we are in. Now, you would, um, if you are following discussions from government-owned uh, policy documents, we were encouraged to increase rice production to fulfill the quest to make Ghana self-sufficient in rice. So you go to most rice production areas and farmers have actually scale up. Mm -hmm. Even we have a special rice initiative in northern Ghana where commercial farmers who want to go into rice production were encouraged to increase their farm size and other things, and that they will be supported with the subsidized fertilizer. So we all did that. Even as an association, we, we plowed the 500 hectares of uh, rice for our farmers in the uh, Yarba area, the valleys, under the block farming. So all the farmers went there and they have their blocks. Now they've been following me. They've done the planting, the rice is germinated, they spray the weeds, and this is the time to get fertilizer. We've been pursuing the districts, the regional directors, fertilizer dealers. And so from no, July, you've not received any subsidized fertilizer? There's no single subsidized fertilizer for the farmers. Following up, what has been the response? The response has been that uh, some of the, the fertilizer dealers that uh, we spoke to, they said the first consignment that was given to them 
and they finished with that. You know, there is an expansion. When they went back to get the second consignment, they are saying that until they finish giving their reports, they were not going to give them the second consignment. But some of them claim that they've done all that, yet we are not able to tell the actual cause of the delay. Yes. So it's a serious um, concern to us. And uh, we got calls everywhere. From here, you can do your own cross check. We got calls from our members, communities, do into maize, rice, what have you, mm -hmm. um, complaining about the situation. We also made a follow up, and nothing is coming. So we have the feeling that if we don't address it, the successes that we made in 2018, uh, we may not be able to get the same. What's been the impact on farmers? It has serious implications. You know, before you start your farm, you have made your crop budget. This is how much I have to spend on fertilizer. So we've all did that. So if all of a sudden you have to rely on the open market fertilizer, which is very expensive, you can imagine the implication that it will have. And most of the farms we have today, the fertility level is gone completely down. If you don't apply fertilizer, the yields is likely to yeah. go low. So we are thinking that if nothing is done, you see, we can address the problem, but it will come late. So we'll go back to the old story. Yeah. Because if you plant your rice by two, three weeks' time, you don't apply fertilizer. Even if you apply it at a later date, the impact will not be felt. Yeah. So it will translate into low crop yields. So apart from affecting the poverty levels of the farmers who invested so much in preparing their lands and then invest so much on seeds and other things, it will also have serious implications on food security facing in 2020 mm. because yields are likely to go back and then we will all suffer the consequences. So is there a feeling that you've not received these fertilizers because they have been smuggled? The smuggling has actually contributed significantly to the shortage. You see, Within this very period that we are talking about the shortage, you go everywhere and they say there's no fertilizer. The same period we see a couple of trucks, number of trucks being smuggled outside the country. Those that came under your watch are what we've been able to identify. And I can bet you that there are a number of trucks that left these countries yeah. without the notice of the security personnel. So we have the belief that greater quantity of the fertilizer is gone outside. Yeah. Now, the president a few weeks ago promised to deal with persons smuggling fertilizer out of Ghana to neighboring countries. What's been the reaction to his assurance from your association? For the, uh, okay, I don't want to go into the details because tomorrow we'll be having a press conference to that. But for us, um, his call is a, a good one. We support it. But our concerns have been the fact that there are a number of um, culprits that were arrested. Hmm. What have you done with them? They are roaming. They are doing nothing. So how can we now believe or trust that the subsequent smugglers will be punished? And these smuggling cases is increasing because those who have started the business, the smuggling business, are roaming. So me, if that was my business, then I go in, or I see my colleague go in to smuggle 2,000 bags of fertilizer. They arrest him, they only turn the to impound the truck, and then they allow him, or if he's a public officer, they only transfer him. Mm. There's high incentive to go into it, okay. because after all, when they get it, the only thing to do is to transfer you. Okay. But if there were serious punitive measures against the smugglers, I think it would have deterred others from so going into it. you want speedy prosecution of persons? Of course. Now, as an association, what more do you think you can do to halt this menace? For us, we've done our best in 2017, 2018. We formed our own um, fertilizer watchdog. You are aware of that. In most of the border towns, we were providing information. We got to a point, we thought that our efforts were not being rewarded. There were instances, we reported smuggling cases, and there were no serious measures against those people. So we spent a lot of money trying to support, address the issue, yet it wasn't working. So we just think that in going forward, there are a lot of things that are outlined in our tomorrow press conference, which I think um, the members will not be happy for me to start talking, mm. uh, discussing them when they've not brought them to public notice. Okay. But we have cut a series of strategies um, that 
we plan to propose to government to, 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 to put in place. Thank you very much for your time. And Charles Nyaba is Program Officer of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. You're watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Let's go to the Ashanti region where the police in Kumase have arrested three persons to assist with investigation in connection with the murder of Utunfuas Asampongene. The 46-year-old was stabbed multiple times to death by unknown assailants at a boom on the Jura in Kransa Highway Sunday evening. Ibrahim Abubakar has been to the house of the deceased to gauge the mood there. The sad day at the house of the late Nana Kojo Afodo, the 46-year-old who was Otun Force at some point in it, met his untimely death yesterday after some unknown assailant stabbed him multiple times whilst he was driving on the Idra Nkranza Highway. As you can see, family, friends and sympathizers have been trooping into the house of the late Oheneba Afodwo to commiserate with the family. The Ashanti Regional Police Command has commenced investigation to arrest the perpetrators and bring them to book. This morning, the information we've gathered so far is that the police has picked three people to assist them with the investigation. They are urging the public to remain calm and assist them with every information that will lead to the arrest of the perpetrators. For now, no family member is able to speak to us because they are yet to officially announce the sad incident to the Asantini or two force it to the second. But what they are calling for is justice. They want the perpetrators to be brought to book. The deceased who was the driver of the Asantini before his instalment as a chief left behind two wives and nine children. As you can see, family, friends and sympathizers have been trooping into the house of the late Oheneba Afodwo to commiserate with the family. TV3 will follow up on this developing story and bring you updates in our subsequent bulletins. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Coming up is the MTN Video Report. And a concerned citizen reports on the practice of sand winning at Kaswa Domia Bratoga in the central region. This is Domia Bratoga whereby sand winning activity is destroying our lands. They do it with impunity. After winning the sand, they never level the land. And they do it to the extent that even after you've even bought land and built, they'll still go ahead winning sand on a sold land. This is a clear indication of somebody's footings being destroyed in the name of sand winning so this is not land litigation but sand winning reporting from obom domiabra toga You can also send your video reports via WhatsApp 055-143-3044. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. In business this afternoon, local furniture manufacturers are counting their losses following the cheap importation mainly from China. President of the Woodworkers Association of Ghana, Abdullah bin Abubakar, says the situation has rendered most woodworkers and furniture producers jobless. A report by Emanuela Arthur. The unbridled imports of all kinds of inexpensive furniture is pushing local producers to the brink as they are unable to make enough sales to cover their cost of production. Inadequate training for local furniture makers and the absence of modern technological inputs have been identified as major challenges facing the furniture industry in Ghana. 
President of the Woodworkers Association of Ghana, Abdullah bin Abubakar, says the cost of production mostly influences the cost of furniture produced locally. This, he says, is as a result of the over-reliance on manpower. He is of the view Ghana can only compete with imported furniture and boost job creation if the needed investment in capacity building is given to furniture makers in the country. Now, because we are unable to produce you know, to that sharp edge with good machines and equipment and good tools, modern machinery, if the government shows the interest to support us to build on our capacity and to build our industrial base, by supporting us to get access to those machines and equipments and skills transfer you know to the level that we can produce similar to what is coming from outside so that we can grow our own local content and create more jobs create more commerce and create more taxes for the government because as we produce more we'll be willing to pay more taxes sales manager at pogas furniture company nicholas danfall says some Ghanaian companies produce world-class furniture, but most customers still prefer the imported ones. Some furniture and woodworkers shared their frustrations. Ghana Revenue Authority, they want us to pay tax, but they don't want to buy furniture from Ghana. All the office furniture are, are imported. So how do you expect me to pay tax? Because you don't respect my work. If you respect my work that I'm doing, you will not go and buy foreign furniture at your office. You will buy made in Ghana furniture. Currently, there are over 400 furniture and joinery companies employing over 40,000 artisans and administrative personnel. There are also nearly 2,000 small scale carpentry shops offering jobs to most Ghanaian youth. Now, persons who have deposits with collapsed savings and loans companies and finance houses have four weeks to submit their claims to the receiver for payment of them. According to the receiver, Eric Nananipa, all payments will be subject to validation for the scheduled period. Statement, amongst other things, alluded to a creditor administration process which comprises submission of proof of debt forms, validating and agreeing to claims as well as payments to depositors. The proof of debt forms could be obtained from the receiver's representatives at the branches of the savings and loans and finance houses where the depositors and creditors operated their accounts. The creditors will be required to attach relevant supporting documents such as copies of deposit slips, account statements, investment certificates and invoices with respect to goods and services supplied or photocopy of nationally recognized photo ID such as passport, driver's license, voter's ID, national ID or notarized power of attorney. Eric Nananipa is a receiver appointed to manage the closure of the 23 financial institutions. Well, I mean, uh, what I'll be doing is reflected in the uh, tenants of section that is, I mean, of, of Act 930. And clearly, the first thing I'm going to do, and which has to be established, is I am the sole legal representative of the companies, all, all the 23 of them which have been placed into receivership. I am the sole legal representative, uh, which means that I alone can sue on, their, on behalf of these companies. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that I have succeeded the rights and powers of the shareholders, of directors, and, and, and management. And therefore, I am, in effect, running the show. The uh, third thing is that I have taken possession of these companies. I have taken possession of their books and records. I have secured the I am securing the assets. And as I speak, uh, I have representatives deployed in all the branches. There are about 500 odd of, um, of, of, of them. This process is expected to be completed by September 12, 2019. Following the validation, the receiver explains that he shall proceed with payments to the extent possible using funds provided by government for this purpose at designated Consolidated Bank Ghana Limited branches. 
In a related development, Executive Secretary of the Ghana Association of Savings and Loans Companies, Trinibua Kodriabwache, is urging customers of the now defunct savings and loans companies to cooperate with the receiver to ensure a smooth process of retrieving their deposits. We are also expecting that the receivership process will be far better managed than um, what we see in their handling of the microfinance uh, process. And so we heard the receiver that they have learned a lot of lessons from handling that of the microfinance sector. And so coming into the savings and loan sector, we are expecting that one, the employees who they want to use, they should as a matter of agency, ASAP, if even by close of this week, their appointment, new appointment letters should be given to them. We are also expecting that the, the customers cooperate with the receivers, uh, the receivership process, because if the customer is agitated and doesn't want to cooperate, it will be very difficult for the uh, customers to get their monies on time. Of course, you may submit your documents and everything, your ID, proof of uh, accounts, and all those things, but you may not get the money as you were expecting. When they occur, we are encouraging the customers that they should exercise uh, restraints. That's it for the latest in the world of business. Inspired by the works and achievements of Kofi Annan, reggae dancehall artist Lexicon has eulogized Kofi Annan in his latest project. He describes him as a fine example worth emulating. Big deal knowing that this man is a Ghanaian and started from humble beginnings like any any one of us to rise up to that office is not just a joke. So I felt that you know the eyes of truth with all said and done should see by the deeds of day. So after looking at all he did um, whilst in, in office from a humble beginning like where he started from then it was worth using my craft as a musician, a reggae artist for that matter to immortalize um, his accomplishments. And that's it for Medilai. Thanks so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of our programs. I am Portia Gabo. Good afternoon.